Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. You need to always maintain personal him to the level of press radio and film. I think this is quite obvious, you know, because we get in all kind of arguments about who's going to represent the group on TV. And, <laughs> and one would want them to be doing it. It'd be a lot of confusion. So this is a non-action. If we get it, we don't get into these things. There won't be any controversy in the group. And I think, you know, we say, you know, uh, it's attraction rather than, I think that has really been the success of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's very difficult because, you know, most everything in the world has to be promoted. And that's another thing that's really different about Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not promoted. Everything that we see is promoted. Uh, and that's what makes us different. And maybe that's what makes us attractive. That we're not promoted. We do not promote ourselves. And I think that's a, one, of, one of the greatest attractions in, in our society today. The lack of promotion. Of course, one of the purposes of this particular tradition is to protect AA itself. If we have a well-known figure, public figure, who becomes a member of AA, and if that figure, within a relatively short period of time, begins to appear in front of the press, radio, television, etc., promoting AA and promoting himself as a member of AA, and then that person gets drunk. Then it looks very bad as far as AA concerns. And I think every time that happens, there's probably two or three people out there just on the verge of joining AA, and they see that guy get drunk or that woman get drunk, and they say, see, I told you the damn thing wouldn't work anyhow. And we end up not only hurting the image of AA, but we hurt future members of AA. Another reason for that particular tradition is to protect we individuals. Nobody loves that kind of stuff more than we do. Nobody loves that recognition more than we do. And we start seeing our name and our picture appearing on radio, television, in the film, etc., then automatically we become better than the other members of AA. And automatically we become something special in AA. And usually our ego gets out of hand and we end up drunker than hell. So this tradition is designed to protect the individual members also. I had one in my group who was so worried that people would find out he was in AA. That's just about all he could talk about. Is nobody tell anybody I'm a member of AA, blah, and finally I said, don't worry. We don't want people to know you're in AA either. <laughs> the 11th tradition plainly states the level at which we are to keep our anonymity, at the level of the press, radio, and film. If I wish to reveal my full name to you within this fellowship, that is perfectly all right. That is my business. I cannot reveal my name and my AA membership at the level of press, radio, and film without breaking this tradition. But I can sure as hell break my own anonymity within AA if I wish to. If I wish to go to my doctor who knows me and tell him I'm a member of AA, I certainly have the right to do that. In fact, it is encouraged that I do so. So the doctor might be able to take another patient and have me 12-step and let them become members of AA. If I wish to talk to my lawyer and tell him I'm a member of AA, that's fine. There is no problem with this unless we do it at the level of press, radio, and film. This tradition is meant to guide us in our public relations policy. It is certainly not meant to hide us from each other within AA. Now, if you don't want to use your last name within AA, 
That's fine also. That's your business entirely. Just like if I want to use mine, that's my business entirely. As long as it's not done at the level of press, radio, and film. Now we can see that these traditions, 3 through 11, are all non-action things. Things we do not do. Things we should not do. Things we ought not do. They are different from the steps. The steps are action. These are non-action. And I believe today that if we will practice these three, these traditions 3 through 11, then we will get certain results from that. And the result that we will get is tradition 12, which is spiritual anonymity. And as we look at t tradition 12, it tells us that it reminds us to always place principles before personalities. Spiritual anonymity is entirely different than personal anonymity. You know, keeping my name away from the press, radio, film, that's one thing. But spiritual anonymity is where we all practice true humility. We all give up our own needs, wants, and desires for the good of the group as a whole. You know, all these traditions, 3 through 11, they go against our nature. And the things that, that, that's the reason they're there, because our nature is to do the things that would screw us up. And if you and I are able <coughs> to repress our needs, wants, and desires through those traditions of 3 through 11, then we are practicing what's called spiritual anonymity, where everybody is the same, everybody is level, we have no bosses, we have no authorities, we are all entirely equal with AA, and whether you have one day's sobriety or 30 years doesn't make a bit of difference. The result of those traditions will be spiritual anonymity. Now, at the same time that Bill presented these to the fellowship, he also presented another thing dealing with this thing we call the service structure. About the time Bill really got these things set up, in about 47 or 48, and about the time he really got the fellowship to the point where they were about to agree to them, Bill found out that Dr. Bob was suffering with another terminal illness other than alcoholism, and it became apparent that Dr. Bob wouldn't live very much longer. And Bill was faced with one hell of a dilemma. Because back in the beginning, when this little alcoholic foundation was formed, Bill and Bob were the spokesmen between that foundation and the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. The people within our fellowship gave Bill and Bob that authority to represent them with this alcohol foundation. The people said, we don't want to get involved in that business. You two guys do all of our representation and keep us out of it. Now then, one of the two people that were our representatives is suddenly coming up with another terminal illness. And they'll begin to see and worry and think about the fact that someday he would die also. And the question in his mind became, when Bob and I are gone, who will represent the fellowship in its dealings with the Alcohol Foundation? And there had to be some way designed, some means, to let the fellowship take over from Bill and Bob and be their own representatives in this business deals as far as the Alcohol Foundation was concerned. Bill knew that if he didn't get it done before Bob died, that the rest of the membership would say, well, he's just waited till Bob dies, and now he's going to take it over for sure. Remember, Bill's a real alcoholic. He knows how people like us think. And he began to work on a design with the help of a fellow named Bernard Smith, 
who was a member of that alcohol foundation, on a little plan, whereas the fellowship could become responsible for its own business affairs. In 1950 at Cleveland, not only did he present the traditions as the second legacy, he also presented this thing called the service structure or the charter for Alcoholics Anonymous. And this charter had 12 little principles in it. We're not about to go through them. But the charter set up a means where each group could, through an elected representative, be able, through another electoral process, select a member for a given area to be their representative when it comes to the business dealings. He told the people in 1950, he said, we have had no experience with this kind of thing at all. And he said, frankly, I'm not even sure it will work. He said, as far as the steps are concerned, they were hammered out on experience. These are the steps we took. As far as the traditions are concerned, they were hammered out on experience of what did not work. He said, this may or may not work. He said, I think it will. And he said, what I ask you for is to give us a five-year experimental plan. And he said, we'll come back together in five years. If it has worked, we can keep it as is. If we need to change it, we can. Or if we don't want it, we can throw it out. And in 1950, they gave us or gave him and the others the authority to put this plan into operation on a five-year experimental basis. Now, all it really consists of, and we're not about to go deeply into any service structure or anything else, but we must understand that there is a third legacy, and the purpose of it is to allow you, not me, but you to have a voice in Alcoholics Anonymous, other than just at the group level. Each group within AA elects, hopefully, what we call a general service representative. There will be so many groups within a designated area that we call a district. These general service representatives come together at a district meeting. There they elect certain officers. They elect what we call a district committee, used to be man, I think it's member now, district committee member, and an alternate, and a secretary, and a treasurer, and whatever is needed to take care of our business affairs at that district level. Also, the United States and Canada are divided up into what we call delegate areas. There happens to be 91 of them. Originally, each state was a delegate area, and each province in Canada was a delegate area. But because of geographical locations, difficulty in getting around, because some areas had large AA populations and some had small, some of those delegate areas were split up into more than one. New York has four, does it not? California, I think, has five, does it not? Texas has four. Missouri has two. Missouri's was not because of extreme population, but simply because all of the business in Missouri takes place either in St. Louis or Kansas City and they split it into two areas. Arkansas has one. Most states do. There is a total of 91 delegate areas. Within the delegate area, there may be 10, 12, 15 of these districts. The districts come together at a meeting we call the Area Assembly. And there are your district committee members, your GSRs from your individual groups, 
get together and elect what we call area officers. We have the area chairperson. We have the alternate area chairperson. We have the area secretary, the area treasurer, and whatever else is needed at that particular area. Now, in the beginning, the area was designed to do one thing and one thing only. At that area assembly meeting, they elected one person to represent that entire area at a business meeting in New York City. And that person was called the delegate. The delegate from area 4, the delegate from area 31, the delegate from area 62. These delegates meet together in April of each year in New York City, and they are the effective voice, spokesman, conscience, and authority for you and I. They are our authority. We give that to them as we elect those people and put them in that position, and that's the way we express our authority and our responsibility in our act. Now, AA is made up, though, of more than just AA groups. Remember, we have a foundation. The foundation has to be incorporated because it deals with business. It hires employees. It pays insurance. It withholds income tax. And it has to be incorporated so we have a corporation that is incorporated within the state of New York, and it is today called the Alcoholic Foundation or the Board of Trustees. Originally, there was five. Originally, the majority of them were non-alcoholics because it was felt in the beginning that we alcoholics would never get it together good enough to run our own business, and we needed those non-alcoholics to take care of it. Bill saw the fallacy of that in later years. Bill began to change the makeup of the board by fighting with people, and he finally did get it to a majority of alcoholics. Today, the board of trustees has 21 members. 14 of them are alcoholic. They have been elected from these delicate areas, from things that they refer to as regions that we really don't need to go into. But there's a total of 14 of them. Seven of them are non-alcoholics. The alcoholics are there primarily because of their expertise in certain areas. We may have an economist on there. We may have one who's an attorney. We may have one who's a teacher. We may have a doctor on there. There can be several different things and reasons for having them on. Now, those 21 trustees own two companies, and very briefly. One company is called Alcoholics Anonymous World Services. It has an office in New York City. We call it the General Service Office. We're all familiar with that term. At the General Service Office, we have staff members there who take care of mine and your business on a daily basis. Those staff members are all alcoholic. Now, they will have other employees there, secretaries, mail clerks, and et cetera, and et cetera, but the staff members are all alcoholics. Also, the Board of Trustees owns another corporation called the Grapevine. We all know what the Grapevine is. And there we have X number of staff members and X number of employees. Those two corporations, AWS, and by the way, AWS also owns the publishing company. We own our own publishing company. Those two corporations are also incorporated in the state of New York. Therefore, they have their own board of directors. But the 21 trustees own and oversee the operation of those two corporations. So we really have the fellowship as one entity. We have the trustees as one entity. And we have the two corporations with their employees as another entity. At the General Service Conference in New York City in April, 
you will find the 91 delegates, you will find the 21 trustees, and you will find, I believe, 24 members, directors and staff from the two corporations. If my memory serves me right, we have a total of 135 yep. at the General Service Conference. Now, the purpose of the General Service Conference is for these two corporations and for the Board of Trustees to report to the delegates on everything that's been going on with the last year, to give the financial reports, to open up all the files, and to make everything available to the 91 delegates. The purpose of the General Service Conference is for the 91 delegates to work with the trustees and the directors of the two corporations to determine what our business is going to be for next year. They set the budget, and then through committee functions, they determine policy, recommend changes, and etc. A new piece of literature, such as the new Reflections book, had to go through the General Service Conference. Anything that we do which constitutes a change will go through the General Service Conference for final approval. Now, it takes at the General Service Conference a minimum of a two-thirds majority voting on something to make an approval recommendation and to make it binding. If my memory serves me right, 90 is two-thirds of 135. The delegates always have a two-thirds majority voting representation. So our elected delegates always have the majority vote for anything necessary at the General Service Conference. They never vote in a block, though, because they never have to. Remember, 14 of the trustees are alcoholic also. They're not about to get together on anything either. <laughs> All the staff members are alcoholics. They're not about to get together on anything either. But if we ever had to, we have two-thirds majority at the General Service Conference. That's the little thing that Bill set up for us. In 1955, they met again. The second international conference was held in St. Louis. And in 1955, Bill presented this plan to them as a permanent thing. The fellowship voted on it and accepted it as the third legacy of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when that happened, Bill said, the fellowship is now safe even for me. <laughs> because he effectively transferred all authority from himself to the membership as a whole. Now, each year as it went by at the General Service Conference, Bill began to notice a lot of conflict going on. They couldn't really decide who is in charge of this damn thing. The delegates have two-thirds vote, but the trustees legally own AAWS the publishing company, general service office, and the great bank. So they begin to fight a little bit about who really does have this authority, and blah, 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 blah. And they'll begin to see this controversy develop and begin to actually reduce the effectiveness of the general service conference. The last thing he did for us was to develop what is called the 12 concepts. Now, people like to say they are the third legacy. No, they are not. The third legacy is the charter, which sets up the General Service Conference. The 12 concepts were developed at a later date in the 60s, and the purpose of the concepts was to do the same thing for the General Service Conference that the traditions do for the group, that the steps do for the individual to give us emotional sobriety at the national and international level. 
You know, these 91 delegates, these 21 trustees, these 24 board and staff members can become as emotionally drunk at the General Service Conference <laughs> as they ever were physically drunk. I know I've seen it happen. They can go absolutely crazy up there from time, and they do. So these concepts, they are referred to as interaction. The action that takes place between the trustees, the delegates, staff members, and directors at the General Service Conference. Let us have five minutes to look at them. We're not going to try to go into them in any depth, but each one of them has a certain little idea. Concept one is the problem. How do the groups express their authority and responsibility for AA as a whole? That's the problem. Concept two is the solution. Concept two says that the General Service Conference will effectively become the conscience and the voice of AA as a whole, representing the entire fellowship. Concept three through eleven deals with interaction. Joe, do you want three or do you want four? I do three. Okay, you do three. Joe likes three. As a traditional means of creating and maintaining clear and defined working relationship between the groups, the conference, the AA General Service Board, and its, its uh, several service corporations, staffs, committees, and executives, and invest in showing their effective leadership, it is here suggested that we endow much of these elements of world service with the tr traditional right of decision. You know, this is a kind of a legal thing, boy, to get you. But you know what is, I'm simply saying is we, each, each group has a right of decision. And we give everybody, even a general, you know, a GSR when he goes to a group, we don't tell him how he should vote. You know, we let him, we give him the right of making that decision because he might get at that meeting and there might be some other information presented to him which would change and reflect on that decision. So we give everybody, each individual, the right of decision. I think it's what it really is saying is when your delegate goes to the General Service Conference, he does not go instructed on how to vote. Yeah. He has the right of decision yeah. and votes according to his own conscience based upon information presented there. John, number four. Concept four deals with the right of participation. Uh, allowing that each classification or group of world servants shall be allowed a voting representation in reasonable proportion to the responsibility that each must discharge. It simply says that nobody in the conference or in our, uh, of the 135 is any better or any worse than anybody else. They all have, all have one vote. Right. One vote. Okay, right of appeal and petition, Joe. Okay, concept five. Throughout our world service structure, a traditional right of appeal ought to prevail. This is showing us the, that the minority opinion will be heard and that the petition uh, for the redress of personal grievance will be carefully considered. So this deals with the minority opinion. You know, even after we vote, we want to make sure that we, we hear everybody in the particular AA. Is, you know, it's one thing, everything goes on by two-thirds votes. And this kind of guarantees us that we get the right opinion. Then after that, we have the, the ones who... Uh, the minority group still has a right and appeal to come back again and ask to be heard after they are voted down. And a lot of times, you know, even they find even this conference that in some cases after they have voted it down by two-thirds, the minority people come back up, you know, or quote the state their position again. The conference can look at it again. And sometimes they change their opinion. So this makes sure that we get down to the to the best information, and I and, uh, by listening more to, to a minority appeal. Number six, concept six, as says, deals primarily with the primary administration, administrative responsibilities of everybody connected with our general service conference and board, and it just lays out how uh, how we're to run our service board. It recognizes that the general service board is the primary administrative authority and responsibility for AA. There's no way that you and I can do it on a daily basis. That job is the job of the Board of Trustees. Number seven, 
Legal rights of trustees, Joe. The legal rights of the trustees. The Congress recognizes the charter and the bylaws of the General Service Board are legal instruments and that the trustees are thereby fully employed to manage and conduct the world service affairs of our hearts anonymous. In other words, we, we know that these people actually, although we have this, this conference that we'll go there and, and, and make these decisions, actually this is the trustees do run this business. They never take any actions, though, that the conference don't tell them to. But we recognize them as the managers of legal entity of the business. Number eight, Sean. Number eight uh, deals with uh, the direct managers of the overall finance and policy. It talks about the delegated authority so as to take care of our business, both financial and power, to make sure that it doesn't get too heavily concentrated in the, any one area. Number nine, Joe. Good service leaders, together with the sound and appropriate methods of choosing them, are at all levels indispensable for our future functioning and safety. And this talks about um, uh, good leadership. You know, are we always anywhere in Alcoholics Anonymous? We would like it is even at the group level. All the way to the top, we want to select the best person we can to represent us because we're no better than the people that represent us. I think one of the greatest mistakes we talk about it all the time is electing somebody at GSR because he's not at the meeting. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm finding to getting the sick here out of the group saying we'll make him a GSR and he'll get well at the service level. No, he'll make somebody else sick. You know, send the best one we got. Don't do that. Number 10, John. Concept 10 <laughs> deals with the uh, authority and responsibilities, and they're well-defined. And it says to be sure that there is an abundance of final and ultimate authority to correct or to reorganize. But let us be equally sure that all of our trusted servants have a clearly defined and adequate authority to do their daily work and to discharge their clear responsibilities. Well-defined. If you're going to give them the responsibility, give them the authority. If they screw up, you can always get rid of them. The worst thing you can do is hire somebody to do a job, make them responsible, but then look over their shoulder every day and nitpick on them. This says, let's don't do that. That destroys the whole thing. Number 11, Joe. Father, the trustees hold final responsibility for AA World Service Administration. They should always have a system of the best possible standing committees, proper service director, executive staff, and consultants. Consultants. This this is talks about you know that we give the uh, the trustees, the people who run our business, the authority to have the best property assistance they can can have uh, from in the field to help them do the job that they have to do. Now we can see that with all those concepts, with the interaction between the trustees, staff, directors, and delegates, that if we will follow these things then the conference is probably going to run pretty smooth. In fact, the results of that interaction will be what we call the warranties of the conference. A warranty is the same as a guarantee. Number 12 says, In all its proceedings, the General Service Conference should observe the spirit of the AA tradition taking great care that the conference never becomes the seat of perilous wealth or power, that sufficient operating funds plus an ample reserve be its prudent financial principle, that none of the conference members shall ever be placed in a position of unqualified authority over any of the others, that all important decisions be reached by discussion, vote, and whenever possible by substantial unanimity, that no conference action ever be personally punitive or an incitement to public controversy, that though the conference may act for the service of Alcoholics Anonymous, it shall never perform any acts of government, and that like the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous which it serves, the conference itself will always remain democratic in thought and action. If these are followed, the warranties will be enforced. If these are not followed, the warranties, Ed, will no longer be a guarantee for us. 
The warranties are the results of this interaction. We have one more little bitty chart, and then we'll turn you loose. We believe that Bill followed the same general pattern or rhythm or layout in all three of these legacies. And again, we don't know whether he recognized that's what he was doing or not. But certainly, in the steps, we see the problem, the solution, and the action which results in a spiritual awakening which gives emotional sobriety to the individual. Surely we see within the traditions the problem, the solution, the non-action, which gives us the spiritual anonymity needed and gives us emotional sobriety at the group level. Surely we see within these concepts the problem, the solution, and the interaction which results in the warranties for the General Service Conference, which gives us emotional sobriety at that level. Emotional sobriety is the key to the individual, to the group, and to the General Service Conference. Thank you all for being here tonight. We hope to see you tomorrow. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.